Well, we're only five minutes late, so we're about ten minutes early by libertarian standards. Thank you all very much for joining us for this panel. I am very excited about this. This is the Black Community Outreach Panel at the 2018 Libertarian National Convention. You guys excited about this? Yeah. Awesome. Now, the reason I think this is so hugely important, not just for the party, but for the movement in general, is that uh, we, we do have race issues within the party, within the movement, and I think most of us have this ideal of being colorblind. And we have these pure philosophical ideals that we want to see embodied in the world, but then we end up denying a lot of the unique experiences that we have as individuals, because we want to say everybody's equal, everybody has the same self-ownership, non-aggression principle applies, but there's a tendency that I've seen in our movement to deny the fact that black Americans have an absolutely unique experience, especially as it relates to government and authority. Can we all agree on that? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, the reason I'm so excited about this is that I'm finally ready to have this conversation. I have often felt self-conscious in addressing racial issues. Uh, I have often felt uh, the, the sensitivity of a lot of these issues holding me back from being able to connect with black Americans, being able to put this message out in the way that it deserves to be to connect with people. And especially because the black experience in America has this distinct feature, this distinct quality in its, its, its relationship with government, there is a huge missed connection here. I don't want to use any negative language that like we screwed up or we missed an opportunity or anything like that, but there is an incredible opportunity because the black community in America, frankly, based on that experience, should be a lot more libertarian than it is. Yeah. If I may say so without being too presumptuous, right? So I'm really excited about the guests we have today for this panel, and they are all very accomplished activists. And I have, I have resumes I'm supposed to read for each one, but our first one, uh, Cynthia McKinney is someone who has been a hero of mine for a long time. My start in activism was with Iraq Veterans Against the War and anti-war activism. And at the time, she was a unique champion of a lot of what we believed in in Congress. She was a Democratic Congresswoman from Georgia uh, for six terms. I, I guess I, I, I'll start by reading this. Cynthia McKinney is an international peace and human rights activist noted for her inconvenient truth-telling about the U.S. war machine. She was held for seven days in an Israeli prison after attempting to enter Gaza by sea and travel to Libya during U.S. bombing and witnessed the crimes against humanity committed against that country's people. In addition to Libya, she has traveled to Cuba, Syria, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, and as she puts it, wherever U.S. bombs are dropping. She's the author or editor of three Clarity Press books, has written one book, Ain't Nothing Like Freedom, and edited The Illegal War on Libya in the 2018 book, How the U.S. Creates if there's an asterisk in the word here, but I think I can say shithole at a libertarian event, right? Okay. <laughs> How the U.S. creates shithole countries. I feel so much more presidential now. <laughs> she holds a BA from the University of Southern California, an MALD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and a PhD from Antioch University. And by the way, this is, this is the last part of her resume, like it's an afterthought after all that. Oh yes, and she is a former congresswoman and the Green Party nominee for President of the United States and Assistant Professor of Political Science and Business. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for my hero, Cynthia McKinney. Our next guest on the panel, you may have heard from Black Guns Matter, Maj Ture is a solutionary hip-hop artist turned Second Amendment activist from North Philly. His following began after he was featured on the cover of Philadelphia, Philadelphia Weekly as the Prophet of Philadelphia. He founded the Black Guns Matter movement in 2015 and tours across the country providing Second Amendment education and information to urban communities. Maj has been featured in the New York Times, Breitbart News, National Public Radio, NRA News for his out-of-the-box approach to Second Amendment advocacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for Maj Ture. Our final panelist is Latanya Whittington, someone who I had the pleasure of meeting in some of my recent travels through Texas. She is the... Uh, well, uh, we're going to give her a chance to tell this exact little story because she has faced some unique challenges recently 
interactivism after having been appointed as the executive director of Houston Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. He's been a longtime advocate of medicinal and recreational cannabis. Personally, in her story, she was diagnosed with, I, I hope I'm saying this right, trigeminal neuralgia, a, an uncontrollable facial nerve condition. She underwent a brain surgery called microvascular decompression in 2014, but still dealt with excruciating pain, and CBD has been extremely helpful in her case. She later joined Normal and is also a Harris County precinct chairholder, a position that keeps her in touch with legislators and politicians in the Lone Star State. She's looking forward to bring together all the Texas Normal Services. This is the old, this is like the, this is a resume that is being updated like as of the last couple days. So um, I, I'm just really excited that we have a, a strong voice like hers in the marijuana reform movement, also willing to be a part of this panel to help the Libertarian Party better connect with the black community. She says, uh, according to this, and then uh, it is, she is looking forward to bringing together all the Texas normal chapters for the next election to show strength in numbers, divided we fall, united we stand. It's necessary to, to achieve a much larger voter turnout at election time by encouraging people to register and then voting for the lawmakers who are for repealing the prohibition of cannabis. She was also the first black woman to ever be executive director of Houston Normal. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for LaTanya Whittington. All right, as libertarians, we're all uh, very concerned with ideology and orientation. So just by way of introducing yourselves, if you could share with the audience in two or three sentences what you would describe yourself as in terms of political ideology or worldview, and we'll just go down the line this way. Cynthia, please. Okay, um, as a result of uh, the things that I've experienced, I did a bit of introspection and settled on what my values are. And so I can say that I have four key values, which are truth, justice, peace, and dignity. So everything that I've done in the past has been motivated by those values, and I'm hopeful that everything I do in the future will also be motivated by those values. Um, I, I, don't, I don't really have the best answer for that question because it's evolving as well as I try my best to stay outside of a particular label. So I think things that pretty much uh, sum me up is, uh, you know, we, we coined a phrase called solutionary, which is we just want to recognize what the problem is, solve the problem, and never have to have the conversation about whatever the thing is. So that's pretty much my ideology. Whichever way it got to come for that to happen, if that means it has to be through whatever party or through whatever background, and so be it. But really pretty much, just a solutionary, find the, see the problem, find the solution, apply it, never have to deal with it again. Uh, well, my ideology is free the way for those in need. <laughs> 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 you know, um, <laughs> I'm gonna work um, until the meat is off of my fingers, my bones, until it's legalized everywhere. Um, first, I'm a civil rights activist, and second, I am a cannabis activist and um, also for freedom. I feel like everyone should unite and come as one in anything that you want to do. Uh, you have to do it united as the people uh, because the government is not gonna do it for you. And uh, I've experienced that in many situations. And also being black and a woman, I've experienced a lot of things and I've seen so many things that has turned people apart. But uh, just knowing that if people can come together as one, there's so much that can be done. And uh, with my illness and my sickness, uh, legalizing cannabis is my passion. And everyone I talk to, I hope that they, I can bring them over. If not, and you don't smoke cannabis yourself, you know someone that needs it. So my hopes and my dreams is that, you know, everyone will wake up and see the beautiful a thing that the cannabis plant can do for you. So um, that's my ideology. Adam. Thank you very much. So what part of your life experience has most informed your activism? 
And we'll start with Maj this time. Oh, um, pain. Straight up, like pain. You, you know, you miss your friends for the summon for possession of a firearm, right? Not, I did something wrong with the firearm. You know, one of those, okay, my friend's gone for the summer because he's fighting this case. Because he lives in a rough neighborhood, he lives where I live. You're gone, you miss your friends. The other part of it is the ignorance around the firearm. You know, whether it's somebody, um, the young person getting a hold of the firearm, shooting themselves based on ignorance, or other types of ignorance where, you know, you, there's no conflict resolution, there's no de-escalation. So, pain and seeing that scenario repeat city to city to city to city every day, you know, that I would go making music before this, it would be like, okay, this is the same story, this is the same thing. And um, you just don't want to see your friends and family go through pain, so especially based on some laws that are so arbitrary. If you create the laws that are restrictive, not taking into account the fact that this neighborhood might be tough, and then you're removing people, and then the conversation about the subject then becomes taboo, then there's no education around the firearm, it's that cycle. So for me, it's definitely a If Just one follow-up then. I, I think everybody here is generally familiar with the racism of the drug war. Yeah. But yeah. would you say that it, there's the exact same parallel in the, the war against gun ownership or, or in that? How would you compare? Oh, it's absolutely, it's, it's more so in a war against guns because firearms is how you can defend your life and your freedom against it. So it's right. more racist. You think the war against firearms ownership is more racist All than the drug war? All gun control is racist. All of it. All of it. The thing now, so the funny part of it is, they'll start to like, um, they, they just try to figure it out in spaces where they could, firearms clearly make money, but it's a double-edged sword for a person that's trying to oppress people. Because it's like, okay, we want to sell firearms, but we don't really want to actually respect the constitutional human rights to defend your life. You know what I'm saying? No different than if a plant grows out of the ground, and we can clearly see it has however many properties and possibilities in, in real time. But we're still, it's classified right next to heroin. And if you are a licensed, you know, if you have a medical marijuana license, you cannot possess firearms federally. You know, so it's, it's a one-two punch whammy, but it's all of it's designed to really keep people powerless. You know what I mean? And from their freedom of choice. If I want to dry up a plant, roll it, smoke it, in the, wherever in my own space with my body, I have that right to do so. It's a mind thing to tell people that, hey, you have to only do things that we tell you are okay. Latanya? Okay. Well, you know, cannabis is a racial issue. I think that um, um, they stopped it because they just didn't want a particular <laughs> race to um, have control over it. I think it's a civil right. Uh, to have your cannabis, you know. I think you have the right to have cannabis. It was legal before, they need to make it legal again. Uh, a lot of my black people are incarcerated because of cannabis, you know. Uh, we have a stigma against us. Uh, you know, we're always looking behind us to see if the laws are following us. We hate to go purchase cannabis because we're always looking behind our backs. Just because we're black is true, you know, because I live it. Uh, when I first joined Houston Normal, I was scared to death when I walked into that room. I was like, these are all these people who smoke cannabis. You know, is the laws going to be here just because I'm black, you know? <laughs> and that's the way that I felt, you know? So after going to these meetings, meeting other people who are sick and need cannabis to have a quality of life, it gave me the strength and the power to say, hey, I smoke weed. And I don't care who knows about it, I'll say it in front of everybody. And it helps me. I went to jail for a joint. I went to jail for a roach in my teenage years. And I think it was the most ridiculous thing. You know, I was embarrassed uh, and messed up getting a job. You know, uh, it's just horrible how they treat us as black people concerning cannabis. You know, we're incarcerated more so uh, than any other race for cannabis. Um, I think it is a racial thing, and they want to keep us down, you know. But what I'm looking for is for us to come together as one voice, as black people, you know, because that's what we're here to talk about. We have a voice, 
we can stand up and say, hey, we want it legalized. And since I've joined my organization, um, it has become more diverse because they see me as the face, the black face, that's not afraid to speak my mind. And now I have Hispanic, I have blacks, uh, whatever you want to name it, I have it there, you know, because I'm giving everybody a voice and that's what we need, you know, to get this thing legalized again. So that's my thought. Now, I know, Cynthia, you have so many stories to choose from to answer this question, especially as a member of Congress. Is there, is there a standout for you that you think has been influential on your activism? Oh, my gosh. I'm almost in no uh, condition to actually uh, coherently say anything. Um, with the way I feel, uh, the way I feel, I think I need some cannabis. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hey, we have some hands. <laughs> this is a libertarian event. After all. You just walk outside of the parking lot and find somebody. I'm sorry. <clears throat> well, what experience of, of, of everything you've experienced in your life, what do you think has most influenced your activism? And if possible, a story that you think might be influenced by race. Well, they say that. Um, we all have our disorienting dilemmas, which are those events that take place in our lives that um, cause profound uh, changes in the way we think, feel, and behave. And uh, so I would say that perhaps my disorienting dilemma in my life was the realization that I was black in a world that really in an environment that, de that devalued black skin. And um, so I had to find myself and who I am and what it means to be me in that kind of an environment, having been raised in Catholic elementary school, Catholic high school, and uh, having had a few clashes with the nuns. Um, about uh, their attitudes. So um, you could say that race is at the foundation of um, that disorienting dilemma for me. And as a result of that, I think um, I've been thinking, and I know I'm, this is not the place for that, but I was re recently asked to speak about identity politics. And so the conclusion that I made was that my identity is not a problem for anybody. My identity is what allows me to survive in a sometimes extremely hostile environment. My identity is what allows me to thrive in an environment that maybe I alone was not responsible for, but learned how to make the best of the situation. So um, I guess uh, what I'm trying to say is that there's so many different facets about this question of race and uh, there the anthropologists don't even believe that there is such a thing as race. <coughs> So um, having discussions like this are always very good. Uh, we need to have them more interactive so that uh, we can get down to accepting each other as we are, no matter what it is that we are. Um, so in a lot of spaces, people are caught up by a concept. The statement that you made, Cynthia, about you know anthropologists saying, "Hey, there may actually just not be race as we know it. It might just be like human, and just different, you know, melanin content or lack thereof, whatever." Um, I think w because people have subscribed to a concept that's been fed to them based on bias, and or based on that certain level of bigotry, they become caught in it, and to them it's real. So because to them it's real, they'll defend that concept, that paradigm, that matrix, right? So. 
getting people to get then so even if someone says oh you know race isn't a real thing they've made a personal commitment to this concept and it's very difficult for them to break free of it no different than if you say hey clearly marijuana should not be right next to heroin on the federal level like that's that's where it's scheduled right so if, if she's doing the work that says hey this is not really true you've you've bought into a concept that somebody initially said that when prohibition happened it was because one guy said he believes that marijuana makes white women want to sleep with yeah. Negro jazz musicians. <laughs> that is the origin of true. marijuana prohibition. You know what I'm saying? So he, he create he becomes the czar of what was turned into the DEA, right? So then you create all these arbitrary rules and you start to condition people. So now my friends is facing football numbers or in jail for football numbers for a hundred pounds of weed. Okay, so when GlaxoSmithKline start popping and selling it, is you gonna let my friends out? You know, so these concepts are things that, you know, that are very key on this panel that, you know, the things that they're talking about because what we're talking about is paradigm shifts, you know, and thought process and things like that. And I think that's very, very key because the thing that we've been accepting for so long, it's not even like real. It's real because you believe it. It's like a virtual reality. It's your reality, but you could really think you can sing in the shower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like we, we, we have voluntarily all put ourselves in the matrix. Yeah. It is a matrix. Yep. Okay, so um, I think it's uh, so important for us to, to also accept that this process of rigging, uh, Frantz Fanon talked about it in uh, Black Skin, White Masks, mm -hmm and went further into this when he uh, wrote Wretched of the Earth. And so the, the, the fact that we've been rigged um, is something that we all must understand. So not only, according to Frantz Fanon, which I uh, uh, believe and agree, and I think is borne out in practice, particularly US political practice, but the colonizer is as rigged as the colonized. Right. You are as rigged as I am. And so that process of unrigging ourselves is something that we all have to engage in. And so um, it's not just uh, conversations like this. There, uh, we have to have opportunities to understand that Hollywood is just one of the riggers. Fox News is just one of the riggers. Uh, everything that we experience in the Matrix is a way of rigging us. And so then we've got to actively seek out ways in which we can unrig ourselves. And that's uh, part of the value of coming to an event like this, where, quite frankly, I don't know anybody. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, you know, this uh, unrigging of myself, I just came from the Red Pill Expo, where, again, I didn't know anybody, right, except Jeanette with Griffin. Um, but um, so the more we do that, the more we'll be able to sit at the common table in, this, in the common room and come up with the solutions right. to our problems and we will leave the rigging, the boxes, the siloing, the, uh, Seymour Hirsch called it the stove piping of our identities. We don't in any way um, dilute the importance of our identities, but we walk into the room with the recognition that we're going to accept everyone and come up with a common solution to common problems that increase our ability to govern ourselves with ethical values. Amen.
ask the next question of Latanya anyway here, but I, this, and this, is, this is opening up a big one here. And if you can speak to some degree to how much Democrats have been able to take the black community in America for granted as a voting bloc, but more generally, how have the old parties, both Republicans and Democrats, failed the black community in America? <coughs> Well, uh, first I'm going to start off saying that you did mention earlier that I am a precinct chair for the, the Harris County Democratic Party, and I have been for quite some years now. Um, uh, the Democratic Party has one way, the Republican has another way, in which uh, the blacks are not participant in it. And I know black, as, as us as black people feel like we do have to vote Democrat, uh, but it's not actually all that true. Uh, they feel like can, can the Democratic ask, Party. Can, can I interrupt just to ask, understand what you feel like you have to? Where is we that feel like we from? have to because uh, they feel like uh, they're the only party that's looking out for them, us. Uh, we feel like they're the ones that's going to save us, that pulls us out of where our deepest place <coughs> where we're at. But first of all, we need to come out of the place that where we're at. A lot of black people, we speak and we talk about what we're going to do, that we're going to do this and that, but we don't come out of the crevices. If you look at the crowd here, what do you see? You know. So the thing is, is that you have to take a step, like I do, and I go in the deepest places where you don't think that you would normally go. And I let my voice be heard. And I let everyone know who I am and what I'm standing for. And if, if more black people would do that, there's so much that we can do, you know. Not only just come out on the time when Obama was nominated for president. I remember those lines. There was nothing but black people out there. Again, we were thinking that that was the way that we can be saved, you know, and that's the honest truth. But it's not. You know, we need to start getting into politics. Our voices need to be heard. And as black people, I'm telling you, we do not think that our voices is being heard. You know, we think when we go out to vote, oh, who cares? They're not listening to us. Because that's the same way I felt at one time, you know. Uh, but when Bush stole the presidency a long time ago, I was there for it. I knew something was wrong with the government at the time. And I said that I was going to stand up and that I was going to do something. If I'm the only person, you know. So first, it's always civil rights. Right now, it's cannabis rights. And I'm fighting until it's legalized in Texas and all over. There's so many sick people that needs cannabis for healing. And it needs to be taken off schedule eight drugs, schedule one, it needs to be taken off. It's not a lethal drug. It's a healthy plant that can heal people. And that is my word as a black woman. Okay, I will stand up. And I hope that people will stand with me. And I hope that my black people can stand with me too. You know, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. that chance to come up here and speak our thoughts and our minds and we want to share it with you guys we want you to be open you know to what we have to say but I know what you're saying in the back of your mind we have to see more of you we have to see more of you but there's a way that you can make that happen you have to reach out you got to get out there you got to go to the churches you got to go to the communities you got to go places where you think that you will never go okay and then if you don't feel comfortable doing that bring somebody with you bring me with you <laughs> i'm from houston texas latonya whittington you can reach me you know <laughs> There's a critical component there. Um, so what she said as far as the Democratic Party, you know, that, that switch happened. That's, that's Lyndon B. Johnson's twist. You know what I mean? That I'll have those niggas voting Democrat right. for however many hundred years. That's really, that was his whole angle there with that. Um, but to be perfect, so do you want to tell that story back? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So Lyndon B. Johnson was the president that said, when the switch happened, I'm going to make black people start voting Democrat. 
Like, never mind the fact that that's the party of the Klan. We're going to ignore that part. <laughs> right? With that being the case, um, I think definitions and going into what she's saying, a lot of times, most people, whatever, again, whatever their silo or their box or their matrix it is, um, they accept it. They may not know his, the historical context of who put that box there and said, this is your box. Right? You check this. Um, we, we tend to vote out of fear or tradition. You know what I'm saying? Well, my dad was a Democrat, my dad was a Republican, whatever, right? Um, the problem there is, you know, and as, and as it relates to firearms, if limiting to that for that quick blip of a conversation, most of the places that have most of the violence are democratically ran cities. The policies are anti-gun, which means if I'm the bad guy in that town, I know that there's less of a chance of somebody being there to return fire or defend what they have, so I'm gonna keep doing this particular thing. If it's a thousand guys in that city doing a the thing, then that policy sets precedent for the rest of the state because they use, for example, Chicago. Chicago's got a blah, blah, blah. But the rest of Illinois has to submit to these particular things. Point being there is, um, those democratic policies, they're very, very good at, you know, manipulating, you know, systems and things of that nature. Um, to be perfectly honest, I have a lot of friends that are Republican, independent, and things of that nature. But it's through your gun rights activism? Through, yeah, through gun rights activism, through just some of my friends is just really rich. It, so, <laughs> they're like, I'm Republican. These, these are the tax breaks that I'm down with. Um, with that being the case, oh, I, have they heard of the Libertarian Party? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Right? Yeah. And that's and, that's another thing. When I'm telling them that, they're like, oh, I didn't even know that I had another option. You know what I'm saying? So, that's where both of those uh, parties, to a certain extent, the Democrat, the Democratic Party, in my um, experience, presents policies that they make themselves exempt from to, de to deliberately make the urban community dependent, even for onto your, you, you know, your self-defense. And you can't have other things that we deem that you cannot have, such as cannabis, such as firearms, things of that nature, because we want you to be mentally and spiritually dependent. Even so, don't get a gun, call the police, someone with an actual gun to come help you, which is backwards logic. Um, the Republican Party has the, uh, the Republican Party and the Libertarian Party, in my opinion, have both failed the same way because the outreach is, um, is minimal. So for example, was there music at this convention? Yeah. No. Yeah. Actually, it was good. So, how many, so there was a sort of, I mean, there have been events with music and dance parties, right? Yeah. But sort of secondary thing. Secondary thing. So that's, so that's karaoke. karaoke. I don't know if I want to hear the return. <laughs> right. so, so that's culture. What was the, what was oh, the what's wrong with me? I love karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't sing it down. The question that you got to ask is culturally, are, are these organizations doing things <laughs> that are inviting to a different demographic that you say you want? So, okay. I know Eric July might have been here. Woo. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But it's yeah, like, it would have been our fourth panelist if you could have made it. Right. So yeah, shout so out to Eric like, July for sure. Those are things that we kind of got to go, okay, culturally, how are we shifting the paradigm in that space? I think the Libertarian Party, because we've um, been so focused on just getting afloat and be making ourselves, hey, we're an actual option. Sometimes some of those things culturally get left behind. The reason why Black Guns Matter is they've been able to make so much headway in such a short period of time is because we have culturally relevant conversations like this one. So the demographic, if you're a felon, I don't care, come to the class and get the information. You might not lawfully be able to, you know, purchase or own a firearm, however, you can have the information about firearm safety so you can spread it to your children, so forth and so on. These things are getting outside of those, um, those boxes. The, the, the problem with most political parties is your, your policies is based in politics, not compassion. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. Well, just yep. to read right. what he was saying, um, with my group also, uh, Houston Normal Slash, Cannabis Reform of Houston, we are a bipartisan group, so we welcome Republicans, you know, Democrats, and Libertarians, Independents, and also the Green Party, mm -hmm. because what we do is we support, not really support, but we give uh, the candidate an opportunity to speak if you support cannabis reform, because it's all about your legislators that's going to uh, be voted, the lawmakers and everything, in November, those are the people is that going to get it legalized. Now, you know, it might be a Republican that's for it. Well, I'm going to say vote for them. I will. 
you know, if it's a libertarian, I'm gonna vote for that person too. You know, you, we just need to make sure that we have people up there that's going to vote for it, you know, not against it, right. Right. you know. Can anybody remember the Libertarian Party at any point, even with our worst of candidates, <laughs> nominating someone who was against legalizing marijuana? <laughs> I don't think we've ever had one. I think we got that one covered. I think okay. we got that. Yeah. So that's why I find myself with everyone, and that's another reason why I'm here, and I do love the Libertarian Party. Yes, I do. This question, how have the old parties failed the black community, is one that Cynthia could easily write a book on from all of her experience in Congress. So I don't know if you can narrow this down. What are the high points? How have the old parties failed the black community? Well, um, I've got three things written down here. Well, no, and now it's uh, four things. <laughs> um, and I'll be as brief as possible because I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, well, the first thing I've written down is Declaration of Independence. So in 2007, I made my own personal Declaration of Independence from both the Democrat and Republican parties that were responsible for taking our country into war, so many wars, interminable wars, and creating new veterans, um, and all of the outrages that happened, and that was done under both Democrat and Republican watches. So I think it's important for us to um, support those individuals who have made a personal declaration of independence from both of those two parties. Uh, the, which brings me to Candace Owens and Kanye West. Um, because both of them um, sort of, uh, how can I say, epitomize the kind of free thinking that has been denied black people. And um, when my fellow panelist, Latanya, when the Tanya said, well, they kind of force us to think a certain way, they kind of force us to do this, and they kind of force us to do that. And so all of the superstructure uh, of the black community, if you would call it a community, um, when everything is not provided, well, how can I say, when everything that is, is not provided by the members of that community, but from outside of the community. So um, that superstructure that exists, even down to culture now, because of course I've done the whole COINTELPRO thing on cultural icons and um, how even our music has been transformed by these outside agents. But um, uh, anyway, Probably just a quick thing for, for people who don't know, COINTELPRO, counterintelligence program, the FBI program from the 60s and 70s to mess with activist groups, especially in the anti-war movement and the Black Panther movement. If you don't know about COINTELPRO, at least go read the Wikipedia page. Everybody who's in any kind of political activism needs to know what the threat from government is. Exactly. And um, so, uh, so we've got this community that really the winners in the community are the people who have been selected from outside of the community to trick and bamboozle the people inside the community to make them think that they are their leaders. And this was a case with Barack Obama as well. Um, the black community thought that they selected Barack Obama, but Barack Obama had been selected from outside of the black community before. Very true. He was presented to the black community as your new leader. And if you go through the COINTELPRO papers, and there's thousands of those pages, and I've read most of those pages because that's um, sort of how I came to understand how things sort of operate in this country. 
Well, anyway, those who are the ones who are left standing are the ones you have to worry about because the real threats were the ones who, were, who had their brains blown out in broad open daylight if they happened to be the president. And they uh, were killed in front of their wife and three little kids if they happened to be Malcolm X. And had his brains blown out and left on a balcony in Memphis, Tennessee if you happened to be Malcolm, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And killed in your bedroom while you slept next to your pregnant partner if you happen to be Fred Hampton, the president, the chairman of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, who should have been the mayor of Chicago or should have been the congressman from Chicago instead of dead. So anyway, COINTELPRO papers is something we must study and understand if we are to have any kind of clue whatsoever about what the government, the government comprised of individuals, is capable of doing against its own citizens. Okay, that's number, I don't know now. <laughs> so then I will conclude this way. Um, what do you have to lose? Those what? What do you have to lose? Six words were uttered in the 2016 campaign by Donald Trump. And as a result, something happened that we didn't know about until Jill Stein of the Green Party did something I disagreed with. And that is she cooperated with Democrats to select certain states in order to do recounts. And when those recounts were done, what we learned was that yes, there was election fraud, not voter fraud, mind you. There's a big difference between voter fraud and election fraud. There was election fraud, but the numbers for Hillary Clinton were wrong. And what they had done is they had padded Hillary's numbers in the black community. And so when the recounts were done, they sh started shedding those numbers away. The black community has been abusing, oh, I wrote down Stockholm Syndrome <laughs> in the end. And so you've got people who have been abused from the very moment that they have been on these shores. And it's all right for us to be, uh, what do they call it, shell-shocked. It's all right. But now, for those of you who say you want to take our country back, and yes, there has been an extremely pernicious transference of the deep state, what used to be the deep state, to who is the deep state today in the U.S. And if you want to take your country back, there's no way you can do it without the shell-shocked, addled people who have been hurt beyond description since the moment they've been here. Once you understand, you in the audience, you of the Libertarian Party, understand what has happened under your watch to a critical component of what it means to take our country back? Once you understand that, I believe is the beginning of the process of putting the country back together again in a way that truly reflects the dignity of everybody that's on these shores. But if there's some harboring of the idea that this is something that can be done alone, that only a certain segment of the people of the U.S. can take their country back, 
then you, I'm afraid, deserve what you get. <laughs> and what um, my erstwhile hashtag unrigged partner, Robert David Steele, is fond of saying is that we're all black now. <coughs> and since I'm the peace person, and I'm sick and tired of these wars, and I say, well, we're all Palestinians now, so I think the future, our future is laid out there for us to see. And either we come together, Paolo Freire also gave us the mechanisms of oppression, conquest, manipulation, divide and rule, cultural invasion, and he gave us the tools for liberation, organization, cooperation, unity for liberation, cultural synthesis, the creation of a new culture. And that's what I think Adam is trying to do. terms than I would have, so thank you. I, I want to I turn over to, we, because we have a little limited time, we'll give everybody a chance, but I, I do want to ask what I think is really probably the most important question for this group right here. And I, I got to start this one with a confession, and it's that as an activist, I've been a full-time activist now for a little over 11 years, it's really only been in the last couple of years that I can say I have felt fully comfortable talking to an individual black person about my politics, about my activism, about what I care about. And I know I can confidently say it's not because I'm racist, it's because I'm afraid of being accused of being racist. I'm afraid of making presumptions. I'm afraid to do that. And, and there's a whole lot of tension. I think I speak for most people in this room in that sense that we want to be able to engage more effectively. We want to be able to communicate with the black community in a way that, that is representative of our true selves, because libertarianism is about love for all humanity. Yeah. So I know for, in a sense, I was hurting as a result of my own deficiency here. And I think this movement, in the same way, is, is hurting and yearning for, for that greater connection between those of us who are activists for love and liberty and the black community for whom we think we have something really, really critically important to offer. So this might be our last round. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We're going to go until we get kicked out of the room. And I think after this, we'll see if we have some time for some good questions from the audience. But I really do think this is the most important question of this event, of this panel. What can you do? What can you say to help white activists or non-black activists be more comfortable talking to black people. Mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one, um... Pass him a blunt. If I may point out, there's... Comedy is huge for breaking down those barriers, and, 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 and I want to point out with, with this panel, get your, if, if, you, if you don't have any objection to this, that, uh, you know, does anybody remember Carlos Mencia? He used to be popular as a comic, right? And, oh, yeah. and he did a lot of racial comedy, and it was, it was very much you know, racist if you wanted to look at it that way, but it was always positive, celebrating differences, and we could poke fun of each other's race when we do it out of love and with that attitude. How do you how do you reach out to black me and pass them a blunt? Yeah, okay, cool. So, so it's, two, it's two things here. One, intent is important. Intent is important. So the vibe, you call it energy, you call it vibes, just trust that shit. That's number one. Being confident in our yeah. intent, right? It's like, yeah. it's like, it's like, you know, I used to have Rottweilers, and my Rottweilers had two, Satan and Sabrina, right? <laughs> Satan was the, the male, and Sabrina was the female. And um, Rottweilers are kind of like, chill out until you cross that gate. But if they can sense fear in you, it's over for you. So that concept is like, when you're having a conversation with anybody about anything, I don't care what your racial background is, it gotta come from a place of confidence and honesty and that's the intent and the energy behind it. Yes. If I start to sense that you're feeling skittish about a thing, now it's up to you leaving it up to me to determine if that skittishness is 
you trying to hide your racism or you trying to hide I'm nervous about having this conversation. So the straightforward conversation is always the first step. Yo, I never knew this about this thing. This is a stereotype that I have been conditioned to believe. Is this true and if so, why? And if it's wrong, please tell me where. We had a conversation with Mike and everybody we hung out with last night. They didn't know, they didn't know what picnic meant for us. Oh. <laughs> so you look, none of the white people look at <laughs> now that's a cultural idiom. See, all of y'all in here say the word picnic. Oh, we're gonna have a picnic. That phrase comes from pick a nigga. <coughs> where they would pick a black person and hang them. You know why that tablecloth is like white with like red blotches? That's blood. Pick a nigga. Picnic. Now y'all didn't know that. So you, I know if you say picnic to me, I'm like, oh, he don't know. Right? But if your intent is, yeah, you, you, hey, black guy, you want to have a picnic? Your energy is, is a different vibe. And that's something y'all got to, you only know that from historical context. Do not have the concept of, well, this is America, everything's equal. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Like, you got to, look, this is a great nation on certain levels, but there's certain stains on the flag that we got to acknowledge. Pretending like it ain't there just because it doesn't make you feel comfortable, there's not, that's not a solutionary lifestyle. That's just some, that's something that you're doing to appease your own guilt. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm also going to say, if you're, you know, like you may have been, Adam, it's also not my job, if you're being genuine, it's not your job to harbor something that you actually trying to get over, but the other person ain't letting you get past. Do not create a guilt complex within yourself when you're trying to be genuine. Can, can I try to explain my interpretation sure. of that real quick? Because I think this is important for the outreach here and the way that human beings are naturally biased if a libertarian goes out and it's your first conversation with a black person on the street and talk about libertarianism and they get angry at you and call you racist, that's just like a, you're talking to a Republican Democrat who calls you crazy for being a libertarian. But, Don't take that judgment. But, Stay true. Keep going. If you're doing it out of good intent, you, you might have one black person who has a negative reaction. But here go the but thing, though. Going. Here go the thing, though. If you if you focusing on principles, see, I if initially in the initial stages of outreach, it's like we don't lead with firearms in our firearms classes. Mm -hmm. You got to first. We got to tell you why this is a natural right. Why it was written into this Constitution while exposing the contradiction of the Bill of Rights while exposing the contradiction, dealing with that elephant in the room, when these guys wrote this, they on the same hand was like, oh yeah, slavery too. Mm -hmm. That's popping for us. That contradiction has to be, you have to do both things. You can't leave one or the other. You can't go, Constitution, Bill of Rights, human rights. Oh, let's not, let's ignore the 400 years of oppression. You can't do that. You know what I'm saying? With that being the case, when you leave him with those, when you leave him with that, to give that person that understanding first, the reason why the Second Amendment is so critical, the reason why firearm safety is critical, it's the lead up into the conversation about the gun and before you even touch a firearm, right? Reconditioning, re-engineering the mental space. Um, it's the same thing when you you're doing outreach in urban areas. Lead with principle. This is what my party is about. The Libertarian Party is about this. Non-aggression principle, I'm gonna be in control of me, you gonna be in control of you. We, that sound cool to you? All right, cool. Then lead into the conversation of race. When you lead with, hey, we, don't, we aren't attacking black people like the Democratic Party did and how you feel like the Republican Party did. You're psychologically you're making a conversation about race again. You know what I'm saying? The principle is the principle. If somebody says, okay, well, let's match your party principle for principle. Let's match your, your, your leaders in your parties policy for policy, right? I voted for Obama in 08. I, I think President Obama is a great human being. I think he's a great father. Um, the, the book, uh, The Audacity of Hope, is one of my favorite reads. I think it's awesome. I think he's a great dad. Visually, if you're 12 years old, you only see two presidents, right? So psychologically, that young person only, you know, whatever, sees that. They see 50-50 in that sense. But then when I look at the policy, because you told me Gitmo was going to be done from the gate, that's not what happened. You told me the you told me the Patriot Act that you campaigned on. You said the Patriot Act was trash and George W. shouldn't have been doing that. You re-upped on that. Mm -hmm. So when we go policy for policy, I don't even have to talk about race. The person you you get them out of that concept back more into the concept of well, it's kind of like this human thing, a more melanated in, you know, and a maybe less melanated in. And then now we just we going into the concept of. Content of character, you know what I mean? Y'all are so 
Yeah. The Libertarian Party is so smart you're dumb. <laughs> Is, hey, and it's, I get the thought process, I understand the intent, it's, I want people to understand that we're not about the race part of it, but if you say that by leading with race, you're, you're couching the conversation in race, and y'all have to have liaisons, y'all have no liaisons, y'all have no liaisons. Join us. <laughs> the liaisons in that sense, um, y'all gotta think of it like the mob, remember them mob yeah. movies? Yeah. You vouch for this person. The communities, those biases in every community, whatever racial background, socioeconomic level, it's always going to be, yo, I don't know this dude. You know this dude? Yeah, I know it. Is you vouching for him? Yeah, because whatever come good or bad is going to be on you. Y'all have to have liaisons. The hood don't trust y'all. A lot of y'all, some of y'all are shooters outside of these nice clothes y'all got on now. Y'all probably like wear wraparound shades and look like cops. You know what I'm saying? We don't know. So with that being the case, you gotta start there. But you gotta lead with principle. You have to print, leading with principle, right? Creating liaisons and, uh, you know, intent, and, and, intent, you know. Thank, thank you, that's very helpful. Well, I'm going to piggyback on what he said. Those were some great values and views. Um, but just to reframe back, everyone have, can do your research. You can decide on which a political way you want to go. Um, because everyone knows the story. We know the good and we know the bad. But it's all about your research and what you believe in. Okay? So long as you do that. There's only 40% of America that goes out and vote anyway. You know, what about the 60%? You know, so we always get into uh, the bickering and the fighting. Let's just get out there and vote. You know, find some party that you can relate to. If it's the Libertarian Party, great. Whatever party is, it's very important that you go out there and you bring people. And I'm going to say something else. Adam, you know, I cannot tell you how you can personally feel. I cannot tell anyone in this room how they can personally feel and how they can relate to a black person. I can't tell you that. No one can. Only you can do that. Only you know how you can confront that yourself. You know, because a lot of people say, oh, well, I was raised in this background, or I never was raised around black people, and when I was raised around them, and uh, we act this way, or my first time meeting them is when I, you know, went to college, and I had that conversation with someone today. I just sit there and looked at them, you know. Well, that seemed like that was a problem with you, you know. Uh, what you need to do, and my suggestion, is find it within yourself to bring in the black people into the Libertarian Party on your own, mm -hmm. from yourself within. Yeah. Because it's all about you know, your feelings. Now, there's a lot of things that you can do. You can go to community churches, you can go to food pantries, you know, you can go to uh, different places where you're gonna find minorities, you can go to apartment complexes. Because the reason why I say these things is because this is how I advocate for cannabis reform in Texas. I go to every place I can go, the Krevets, you know, Houston area, and even uh, New Orleans, I'll go where I can to let people know to free the weed, <laughs> and it needs to be free, you know. So just to, um, you know, answer the question, Adam, that's going to come within yourself, you know. It's something that you're going to have to build within, and you're going to have to step out of your realm of what you're used to doing, you know, and start doing other things, you know, that will take you to the other place where you can feel comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable, you won't be successful. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be honest with yourself, you know. And, and I, you know, had to do a lot of changing within myself too. I can go to the best of the best places. I can go to the worst of the worst places. Why? Because it's within me. I have a passion to help people, 
you know. I want to help people, whatever they need. If they need cannabis reform, they need cannabis, I'm going to help you. You know, if you need a place to stay, I'm going to try to help you find it. You need something to eat, I'm going to try to help you. So that comes with the passion in your heart and passion that you have for people. So I'm going to say the main way to do it would be your passion for people and all people. <laughs> I know this might be a little easy for the Libertarian Party to say, being the up-and-coming third party that we are, but it is very nice to acknowledge that in doing Libertarian Party outreach to the black community that we are the only political party of at least the major three that has not screwed over the black community in America. <laughs> What the Tanya just said was so helpful, I think, in that, in, in, in that this is a process that, that we all have to go through. But I, I want to ask the audience, how many of you, just by, by show of hands, have in some way shared the discomfort that I expressed in talking to people of a race different from your own in political outreach? Thank you. All right. right. Yeah, thank you. Honesty. Honesty is real. Now, and I want to say, just <laughs> by virtue of being here to this, for this event, for this panel here tonight, I think you should all have a, a, a greatly increased confidence in your intent and in being able to do that outreach. And I hope that that's something that you can get out of this experience tonight. So, Cynthia? Yeah, I um, am compelled to mention a book whose author I can't remember now. Um, but the name of the book is Two-Fisted Racism. And basically what the author says is that most whites in the United States are kind of like Adam used to be. They wanted desperately to make this first step. But because we have been conditioned and siloed and balkanized as a population, the opportunity to actually have a, substan a, a, a substantive discussion with someone who comes from an entirely different Political, political persuasion and background is the opportunities are virtually non-existent. So those of you who raised your hands just now, where are you going to have the opportunity to actually carry out what you want to do in an environment that's safe enough so that you won't feel like a blithering idiot by the time you finished your conversation. Joe Fegan. Joe <laughs> Fegan. I looked it up for you. Joe Fegan. <laughs> the author. The author. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Detroit. And uh, so um, this, this book basically kind of informs this idea that you'll hear me talking about power cells. And hopefully, you will hear me talking more about power cells and hopefully in the not too distant future you'll actually see me doing power cells because at the Red Pill Expo they said we don't have time for that Cynthia the situation is so dire in our country that we don't have time to educate people on how to relate to one another as human beings again so um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, the, the recognition is there that there's not these opportunities and it's more difficult to just reach out. We are accustomed to doing it because that's been our lives. We've had no choice but to show up in places like this and take our chances that we'll get out alive. <laughs> right? <laughs> Anyway, I want to say to the brother, I need one of those shirts. <laughs> right, well, we're not getting kicked out yet, so I'm going to take three questions from the audience super fast, please, in respect for time. We'll just go right to left, so on the far side. Thank James, you. please. Hi, right, Cynthia McKinney. This question is for you, mostly. Um, uh, a local issue. Hurricane Katrina. The hearing. They had the hearing... And Pelosi said no Democrats should participate in the hearing. I don't know why. Some kind of peak of 
anyway, and you and only one other Democrat, I think, participated. And you brought up witnesses from here in New Orleans, including, I think, Mama D, right? Yes, that's right. And she said she heard the explosions yes, in the right. canal flood walls. People call them levees, but they're actually flood walls. Yes. Uh, that flooded our city. And uh, it was outrageous. Uh, no one talked about it. And I just wanted to ask you if you could expand on that a little bit. Did you get any more feedback from that? And how about, you know, just getting outreach, you outreach to all those people in New Orleans whose voices were being ignored and brought them up. And how can the rest of us do that? And I want to know uh, what kind of flack you got from your leadership and uh, you got, if you got crap for doing that, because that was an amazing thing you did that almost no one recognized. Like Alex yeah. Jones played, played your clips of you doing that, but that's about it, really. So please, tell us about that. Well, um, yeah, that was just one of those uh, passion-driven outrage, moments of outrage, um, and I literally forgot that I was in New Orleans. I forgot. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, how could we ever forget the um, complete, uh, how can I say, the um, Uh, there's almost no words, and, and you're right. Thank you so much for remembering uh, the Still world. Track. Yeah. Um, if, if I may even better yeah. introduce Cynthia on this subject, one of the reasons she's a hero of mine is that she was the only member of Congress to question 9-11 right after it happened. And there's a video... Yeah. <laughs> Also, they're grilling Rumsfeld about three trillion dollars missing on September 10th. So this is something that, as a congressman, yeah, absolutely. And Chertoff, uh, I grilled Chertoff because if you remember um, the well, what I asked Chertoff was why he should not be prosecuted for murder because of what the government did not do to protect the survivors of Hurricanes Katrina and Rita at that time. All right. Yeah. Time Sorry. for just two more quick questions. I have a, a question for Monster Radio. Uh, I was listening to the radio. Could you speak up a little, please? I was listening to the radio in Baton Rouge, where I'm from here in the and there was a new story on NPR that was saying that Baton Rouge had the highest per capita rate of accidental uh, firearms in the country. And uh, being from Baton Rouge, uh, and being a firearm trainer myself, I thought I should do something about it. You know, I, I should maybe do a free class, especially for people in the black communities who are disproportionately affected by yeah. that type of thing. And uh, now that I've heard about your organization and read a little about you, I'd just like to see if I can volunteer. For Good. Can <laughs> so yeah, that, yes, you can <laughs> volunteer. <laughs> right. um, I've got uh, some near pizza. <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about? We have a quiz to that. So to piggyback on, yes, so that's one I got there. I'll give you my number when we get out of here. Um, to piggyback on that, there's another con game being played on your, on your perception. Um, they'll say, oh, there's 30,000 deaths, firearms related deaths annually in America. So one, they don't tell you that like over 60% of that is suicide. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I'm saying? So 60% of the whole pie is suicide. The next big chunk of that are accidental or what we call negligent discharges. Like young people getting their hands on firearms. That's why you see stories where the young people shoot themselves in the face because their hands are little and they usually turn the gun around backwards to pull the trigger and they use their thumbs, right? That's, that's something that's completely preventable. That means the parent or the adult around did not secure the firearm properly. So then that percentage of the numbers of, you know, the, that 30,000 is put into that number. They don't tell you that there's a big chunk of that that is if you're the bad, if you're the good guy and you shoot somebody, let's say if a law enforcement officer stops the rapist with a firearm, he shoots him. That number goes into the number, even though he's the good guy with the firearm protecting life. So all of these different things are, they throw a number out there to assault your senses and because it's trauma, 
right? And you don't know the context or the breakdown of the things. You don't know that there's a bunch in Baton Rouge, there's a bunch of young people getting access to firearms. That's an education issue. We can train people about biometric safes alone. They're cheap, they're inexpensive, they're much more secure. You can tie them to your fingerprint, boop, and they don't open unless your hand touches those five, you know, prints on the, uh, the actual box, the lock box. You start informing people about that, you'll start to see a drop in those fatalities in relation to firearm negligence. You see what I'm saying? All we're saying here is, there's a lot, there's a, there's a, again, there's a con game being played on you. The reason why the con game is being played on you and they saying these things in local areas, but that stat doesn't come out nationally when these organizations fight against uh, firearms ownership, they don't tell you that because a firearm is how you defend the things that you believe in. You, if you got like stuff and the zombie apocalypse happens, <laughs> You just gather supplies for the other side if you don't have any firearms. That's just what it is, you know. So those are the types of things that we, we definitely got to be on top of. Just just dig a little deeper, when, especially when you get hit with them stats. Just look a little bit into the numbers a bit. All right, one last question. Mark, by the door, please. <coughs> Hi, Cynthia. How you doing? Hi. I thought that was you over there. Hey, I just wanted to publicly commend you. Cynthia and I have worked with the American Muslim Alliance. As you know, they were very concerned about the 9-11 and the Patriot Act. And I want to shout out to Cynthia because she's been obviously outreaching to us here, but this is no flash in the hand. You've been doing this for a long, long time. And I very much commend you. And I'm delighted you're here, and I'm delighted we got to work together to, uh, I don't know if the California people know this, but working with American Muslim Alliance, we actually got measures passed in both houses of the California legislature condemning the unconstitutional part of the Patriot Act. And it's because the work of the Greens, the work of the Republicans, the Democrats, the mayor of the Raza, the Archdiocese of uh, San Francisco, and of course I was the representative from the Libertarian Party. So working together as a coalition, we actually managed to get it passed. And I believe there was something over 400 different governmental entities Pass resolutions against the Patriot Act, but obviously California was the biggest of them. And again, keep up the good work, lady. Kill my audience. Actually, he was my introduction to the um, Libertarian Party, and um, uh, you introduced me to Wes Benedict. Wes Benedict. Oh yeah. Right. Okay, and uh, that meeting didn't go too well. <laughs> Why not? Tell us what happened. Oh. <laughs> Tell us about his poor outreach. You need to know. That's a lesson for us. Yeah. Oh, no. He's running for outreach. <laughs> do, do you want to give us the lesson from that one? <laughs> what happened? Oh, yes. Fiscally conservative. Well, the lesson, I guess, is that um, you can get over those, um, what, those uh, initial impressions. Because I'm back, right? <laughs> All right, I want to give each of our panelists uh, a, a chance to sum this up, if you, if you could, just a minute each, and we'll, we'll start with Cynthia and, and end with Latanya. Okay, well, you can uh, find me on the socials, and because of Adam now, I've also got a Steam It uh, account. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Minds.com, you can find me there under my name. Uh, Coast on Facebook, there's lots of them, but I call them fake spook anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, just uh, uh, stay tuned because I'll be doing, I'll be writing this proposal for um, the power cells. And if, if I'm able to actually get that funded, then I would love to have <coughs> you guys participating in the same room, same table conversations where we uh, defeat the deep state by defeating dividing rule. Uh, first, thank y'all for, you know, Adam, everybody, you know, for coming and doing the panel and stuff. And uh, thank y'all for coming out. Uh, you know, we, we've hit about 40 some odd cities now. We're doing it all off of GoFundMe. If y'all want to shoot some money, that helps. Um, outside of that, you know, I would really just want everybody to kind of like get more focused in on 
the Second Amendment in the sense of how that relates to us, especially from different demographics. Um, not only just in the firearms component of it, but the thought process that's necessary to, um, you know, make sure that we, we, we create in that passion for our personal defense, you know what I mean, to defend the things that we love, that we care about, you know, so that's, that's really it there. Um, Y'all can hit me on all of the social medias, um, it's at Maj Touray, M-A-J-T-O-U-R-E, um, and that's it, just pretty much, I'm just thankful for y'all to have me. First, I'd like to thank everyone uh, who took the time to come and listen uh, to the panel. We really appreciate you guys coming. Adam, thank you for adding me uh, to the panel and also your wonderful crew. They're wonderful people. Uh, to my Houston people, uh, my cannabis uh, reforming Houston and also uh, the cannabis open Carrie Waugh, Corey Watkins, and what she ran for governor of Texas, he lost to Mark Tibbetts. But that's who introduced me to the Libertarian Party and also to Awesome Adam. And uh, what I want to say is free the weed in Texas. Yeah. Don't forget that. I want, to, I want to give a special shout out to Ben Farmer for helping put this panel together and for all of you for being here, for having the courage to engage in this conversation. If you got something out of this, please give it up for our panelists and keep it